Uh, but Cameron has, has been involved in uh, Brain Hack, so Mira Academy is kind of a little like Brain Hack. We still have the name, differentiated it just, just a little bit. But Cameron's been involved in Brain Hack, has really been instrumental in, in kind of creating a community for this, this, uh, this kind of uh, research. And, and so we thought it would be great to have him just tell us a little bit about what hacking is and what the history of the community is. Thank you very much, Tal. How are y'all doing? Y'all feeling good? Your brain's oozing with new knowledge? All right, so, you know, the next week, uh, the next four days, are going to be an opportunity for you to apply that new knowledge to something you care about, right? And that's going to be in the, the hackathon session part of it. So, um, and I guess after today, that's what begins. So they asked me to come and, and kind of kick that off a little bit uh, with the story of Brain Hack. Uh, I, I've seen definitely some familiar faces from other events we have. Who here is familiar with Brain Hack? And those of you that aren't, uh, are you completely unfamiliar or have you kind of heard about it and maybe didn't know whether or not you were interested or not? <laughs> okay, well hopefully I could tell you more and kind of convince you that it's something for everybody and hopefully a valuable thing. Um, so the idea for Brain Hack was kind of produced out of me and some of my colleagues who were, you know, postdocs, uh, senior graduate students at the time, and we would attend conferences, uh, and I'm sure you've had a similar experience where you attend conferences and you have an opportunity to meet people who are your peers who are working on very similar things as you, and you build these relationships that are uh, very exciting, kind of at the borders of what typically happens at a conference. Um, and also, I've also had the experience where through some of the workshops that I attended that are kind of like sleepaway camps like this, for example, and you end up meeting people at those who end up being close colleagues of yours for the rest of your life. Uh, for example, Gael, I first met in 2006 at a, at a math and brain imaging workshop in, uh, in LA that was hosted at IPAM. And we've been collaborators and colleagues ever since. Um, Guy is not in here right now, so I can say anything I want, right? But, the, uh, but that's happened over and over and over again. And, and so the original goals behind Brain Hack were to create these conferences or workshops that really accentuated that, right? Really focused on people getting together, working together, learning from one another, and collaborating during a period of time, and not the other parts of the conference that are, although very good and everything and of their own, um, aren't, isn't necessarily the only way to do a conference, right? So for example, when Brain Hack first began, or the ideas behind it, was at the Resting State Workshop, and if any of y'all have been there, it's a very dense conference, right? Every five minutes is scheduled with a talk. It's really hard to do anything other than uh, engage in those talks, and all of that is very important, but it's not necessarily the only way that we can build a community or collaborate in the community. We, you know, kind of the idea is going into Brain Hack is how to build more of those things that are at that fringe. Um, so the word Brain Hack uh, and the whole Brain Hack thing came from something that was called Space Hack. And I believe Space Hack is still there uh, if you look. So Space Hack was a, a citizen science initiative that was associated with NASA. And what it was was opportunities and projects where just anybody, high school students or whomever, could contribute in astronomy. Economy, right, and to, to learning more about the universe. And, and we all know of examples of how crowdsourcing different data sets or crowd, uh, yeah, sourcing different data sets in astronomy has yielded big rewards. And it was sort of kind of built around that idea. And so Brain Hack, we stole the, the name kind of from Space Hack. Originally we wanted to steal the, uh, the, the, the web design from them as well, but they told us that that was copyrighted and we couldn't share it, which I thought was a lot of irony, right? I mean, the, the, but, but whatever. So we created our own thing with Brain Hack, but the big ideas at the time were Hackathon and Unconference. Both of those come from the technology sector, and we kind of bastardized those things in order to make a Brain Hack. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So this is from the, the original, the, this is the, the, the original organizers of the very first Brain Hack event that happened in Leipzig. Uh, so you might remember, uh, recognize a lot of faces here. It's, it's very remarkable seeing Pierre Belek looking that way. Uh, that's how, when I first met him, he looked, now he's got this big beard and he's very serious and he has three children. He's probably the most reproductive man 
man that I know in, in brain imaging. Uh, he likes to take reproducibility strong. Roberto Toro, he's, he's hugely involved in these things. Of course, Daniel was at Leipzig. He was kind of the, the, the thing, that, the energy that really kind of made it happen. Some of the things you'll notice about this picture is that, well, one, not many of us look this way anymore, but also it's very, it's six dudes, right? Six, yeah, five white dudes and a Chilean um, that are doing it. So we've, a lot, a big effort that we've undertook over the past few years, and hopefully something we're successful, is very much oriented to increasing the diversity of what goes on. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. What I, as soon as I put it up, I was like, whoa. <laughs> That's, yeah, anyway. But, um, but that kind of is where everything started. So this idea about building these social interactions, actually working and collaborating and sitting together, right? So Brain Hack is about open neuroscience, right? It's about the open interchange of ideas, exchange of ideas amongst people um, in order to improve their, their, their research. It's about collaboration, so working together with people rather than competing with people. Um, so in, it, when, when these brain hacks started, and when OHBM started a hackathon, they wanted to have competitions in order to intrigue people, you know, in machine learning and other data analysis. That's kind of what they live by, are these big challenge problems where people rank each other next to one another. And we didn't want to be about that. We wanted the brain excuse me, hack community to be more about people working together to solve hard problems rather than working against one another. Um, and it's really about meeting new people, getting in touch with new ideas, learning new skills, right? I mean, just the ideas that you're exposed to, just hearing a new thing, can be very transformative to your research. And it's about creating those opportunities to diversify at, at, at all the different levels, right? Intellectually, in terms of what you're, the, the, um, science that you're doing, but maybe also creatively, right? Thinking about how brains can be artistic or, or, or things of that nature. Um, and also we wanted it much, it, rather than being prescribed, brain hacks, the goal of them is for as much of the content to be generated by the people who are in the room, right? Rather than some, you know, five or six person committee who makes decisions over what oral presentations are allowed to be heard, right? So it's much more about being dynamic, programming on site, and about the people who are in attendance actually setting the agenda and describing what we're talking about. And also, hopefully, all of this together will accelerate science and reproducibility. If not, at least it'll give us an opportunity to kind of hang out every once in a while and do things we enjoy, right? So as I mentioned before, uh, when we started, the kind of the two pillars of the brain hack were unconference and, and a hackathon. And we'll talk a little bit more about those, but then we've added a strong educational arm. And this event that y'all have been taking, uh, uh, that y'all have been attending, is probably one of the best examples of kind of the, the educational opportunities that can be driven out of a, a, of a model like this. And I think it's a, a very great adaptation of what we started with a hackathon in order to make it much more about teaching. Uh, other hackathon events like the OHBM hackathon we have, that now has a train track where there's training all throughout the day. A lot of the training is geared towards developing um, skills in, in either informatics, data analysis, and computational skills in order to be able to do the things that you need to do, right? Um, a lot of graduate programs in sort of related fields to brain imaging um, and to other neuroscience data analysis really don't emphasize these tools enough. So the goal is, is this can be an opportunity to learn that. And so uh, Ariel has actually been a huge leader in that regard and through connections with um, uh, software carpentry and other things that are very nice programs geared to help you do this. Has he talked about software carpentry? Are y'all aware of that? Software carpentry? Y'all know what it is? Okay, but it's about teaching computational skills to scientists, right? And ho hoping that scientists learn more about it. So <clears throat> that's been a lot of the, the educational do we do. So some of the things that typically happen at a, at a hackathon event. Um, so this is an adaptation of a hackathon event. So not all these things have happened or will happen. Um, but so generally we kind of start with a meet and greet. Again, the, a lot of the emphasis is on people meeting one another, learning about one another, and developing relationships. So our meet and greet is an opportunity for people to introduce themselves to one another. Uh, there are a few prearranged lectures typically at a hackathon. Those are very 
very few, a lot more at a more educational driven event like this. But these are more meant to be inspirational, to encourage people to think about big ideas, or to kind of excite them, get their blood glowing in the morning. Um, we have a lot of open work time that are guaranteed, or that is time set aside just for you to work on your projects. And then there's also these unconference sessions, which are, are oral sessions that are dynamically organized on site by the people in attendance and typically cover either things that people want to talk about or things that the community or the attendees want to learn more about, right? Um, and then we also have wrap-up sessions where you show kind of what you've uh, produced, right, at the, throughout the course of it. So we talked a bit about hackathons, and many of you probably have heard about hackathon in the sense of like computer programming, right? Um, and there's a lot of these hackathons and hacking competitions and things. And so a definition of hackathon would be, so a brief event, one to a couple of days, where computer programmers and others involved in software development meet and collaborate intensively on software projects, right? So this right here is the biggest problem that we have explaining the brain hack to people who are potential attendees, right? Is this word hackathon that we associate ourselves with? And the problem are the things that I've crossed out. Computer programmers, others involved in software development, software projects, right? Our goal is to bring people together from a vast variety of different backgrounds to collaborate together on brain projects, right? On brain science. So that includes all of these people. People from the neurosciences, people from more analytical, people from more computer, uh, orientations to be involved. So the hackathon and brain hack events and Neuro Hack Week and Neuro Hack uh, Academy are not just about people coming to program uh, on computers, right? It's also about neuroscientists to come to integrate and collaborate with others in order for us to improve the quality of neuroscience that we have. Um, so hopefully if through this experience if you were worried before about not having the right level of programming skills in order to participate in a hackathon, hopefully you've been disabled use of that idea, or maybe you've picked up the computing skills you need to have that confidence, but the hackathons are not just about computer programmers sitting in a room and writing code. It's about, the brain hacks at least, are about people working on projects together with one another. And we'll talk a little bit about what uh, app good projects are. Oh, actually it'll be the next talk slide. So usually there are projects that happen at the hackathon, and again, these are kind of dynamic and organized on the event. So at some phase during the hackathon event, usually right at the beginning, that you have pitch sessions. So I think it's scheduled for, to, for tomorrow where people will, will talk about projects that they're interested in. So hopefully all of you have some idea of a project you would like to work on, hopefully something that kind of consolidates all the things that you've learned and applies it to a real world problem that you actually care about, right? That something that may go into either your dissertation or your, your other work that you're doing, something that can contribute in a meaningful way to your science. Right? But these projects don't have to be developing software tools, right? I mean, this could be a cortical thickness analysis of autism. Right? This could be people sitting together to think about uh, you know, what are the best measures to put into a quality assessment toolbox and just kind of coming up with a list so that you can act on those. It could be an you know, uh, uh, individual just pinging and interacting with three or four or five different more senior people who can help them build a pipeline to do DTI tractography and understand it from many different perspectives. Right? So there's a lot of ways in which these projects can be very beneficial to you and, and can kind of fit within um, what we're hoping for. Um, and you know, these projects involve intense collaboration throughout the event and hopefully beyond. Hopefully uh, these projects, and most of the most successful projects that have come out of Brain Hacks and these hackathons have persisted and in, in ongoing um, and have resulted in packages that maybe some of you use, um, which are always kind of great. Um, so uh, here's... <laughs> More pictures from the hackathon. So this is from, from uh, Lausanne. This is, uh, so OHBM now has an annual hackathon that many people in this room uh, are involved in organizing and keeping going. We have a website, we'll talk a little bit more about this, brainhack.org. It has the ability for you to submit projects. If there's an ongoing project and you're interested in getting collaborators to help you work on it, you can submit it here. Also, we, we list all of the events. There's been so many events, it's probably kind of overpowered by the events now. Um, so you can, you can get a little bit of a better idea about it. So some of these interactions are, you know, you've got uh, Daniel and Pierre kind of lounge, lounging around without the socks. So, you know, these are very, you know, collegial, collaborative, and, um, and uh, 
uh, relaxed sort of interactions. And, and this here is a picture from our very first brain hack in one of the uh, outstanding workspaces that was available to us in Leipzig. Um, so again, the unconference, these, are, these can be kind of timed out sort of sessions like what uh, you've seen uh, today, kind of like these talks, but also we, uh, you know, the goal is, is to have kind of spontaneous things come up, right? So for example, if people are talking about, well, we should really create, do all these things on a GitHub project so that we'll have revision control and be able to track it and everybody will be able to do it. And then other people are like, well, what's GitHub? I don't understand what it is. And, and then maybe you can encourage somebody who's here who has a, expertise in GitHub to get up and give a talk, right? The goal is, is to have that level of spontaneity, but also to make it relevant to the topics that are important to what's going on. Um, I believe there, there are actually some unconference sessions uh, that are scheduled. I don't know exactly how um, those are going to work out. Um, and then we've talked a lot about the education. And a lot of this education though, so there are educational programs, there are the things uh, that, that you've already gone through that are tutorials and courses that are set up. But I, I encourage you to think a lot about and not to devalue the education that you get just from kind of bumping heads with other people around you. Uh, your peers are great sources of mentorship. And it's probably, I think, one of the most um, the best resources you'll have for extracting information from this event will be the people that are around you in building these relationships. I mean, I think the talks are invaluable as well, but the, uh, these relationships will really help you in the long term. Um, and you know, of course, you get the rules, right? So brain hack, the rules of brain hack, rule number one, well, there are no rules, right? Well, except that doesn't really work out. The number one rule and the pre prevalent rule is just don't be a dick, right? So just think a lot about what you're doing and why. And, and not all of us really have a, a strong, uh, you know, maybe understanding about what being a dick entails. So we decided to codify it, right? So uh, some of our colleagues actually that worked with me who were helping me develop one of the uh, brain hack globals that we did a while ago, and I'll talk about brain hack global in a minute. They came to me and they felt like we really needed a code of conduct. And I don't know how well this compares to other code of conducts out there. This is one that's an open science, open source one that um, many other hackathon types events uses. But essentially, you know, don't harass people, don't talk about people, about where they're from, about any of those things, right? Don't uh, act with anybody in an in a awkward or unwanted sexual way, right? So anyway, we, we did create a code of conduct and I encourage everybody to sort of think about these things and honestly I encourage you to think about them all the time. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of what we're working on now are uh, diversity issues and to some degree these are linked to the code of conduct, but we want to be as open and inclusive as everybody and we don't want people to feel like that they're not going to enjoy their experiences at the hackathon events because of their skill levels when it comes to what they do or anything else about them. Clearly I don't deserve to be here. Oh, is it? Is this a, is it coming back? Cool. All right, so. Oh, I'm sorry, that's fine. <laughs> I don't, it, what I see over here is completely different. I don't get it. Oh no. So, um, so that's most of what I had to say about brain hacks. Uh, so we've had a lot of events right now. We've had up to about 30 events. I'm including this as a, a brain hack event as well as the Neuro Hack Weeks. So originally when we created these brain hacks, they started off as international events where a lot of people would go to. And so we would have it maybe a week before a conference so that people could kind of double up their time when they attend the conference. And Daniel and I, from the beginning, we liked the, with the idea of the brain hack, we wanted it to be more than something that people did periodically. We wanted people to build local communities of where they work together and 
export this idea uh, to the kind of the local level. Well, when we really started talking about this at these big international events, the um, people were like, well, you know, that probably won't work in, you know, my neighborhood because we don't have any big name people to come and draw uh, other researchers, or we don't necessarily have the resources, or there's only five people that do neuroimaging where I'm at, or, or neuroscience where I'm at. So, so they're not, there's not that much interest. So what we created were these large scale distributed events. So we've had four now. Uh, the first one was Brain Hack EDT, what, bedtime is what Satra ended up naming it. But the idea was to get all of the, to get several different locations within the Eastern Daylight Time zone of the U.S. to have Brain Hack events on the same day. And then they could share information uh, via video conference. Um, and, and so then you can kind of have this, uh, you could distribute uh, content from the bigger sites to the smaller sites, thereby getting rid of many of these concerns that people had about getting people to show up locally. And so that actually ended up being a very successful model. After we did it uh, that first time, people were like, well, you know, why am I punished for being on the East Coast? Ariel really wanted to have one here. He's like, you know, why am I punished for being in an awesome place? And so we, um, we decided to make Brain Hack America. So we opened it up across the U.S. For the last two years, 2017 and 2018, we've done Brain Hack Global. So we we have, uh, during a, a weekend, or a, a particular week, we have distributed brain hack events at, um, the first time was in 2017, and it was 34 locations throughout 15 countries and four different continents. So it's a really massive scale. And we've had, a, a, that year there was over a thousand attendees that came to the different events. Um, this last year in 2018, we had 33 locations that were um, spread over 15 countries and four continents. So we still have both, all the continents, we lost a country or two there, but still we've had over, we expect that this one is over a thousand. We're still getting in some of the counts um, on that. So there's a lot of these opportunities for people to get together and to have these styles of events. I encourage you to uh, keep in contact and to uh, consider hosting a local event if you enjoy these things um, or, and to participate hosting some of the, the international ones. So the ways in which you can be stay in contact, of course, one way is that web page that I just mentioned. Um, and another way is through the um, is through our Slack channel. So uh, similar to the Neuro Hack Week Slack channel that you've seen, there is a Brain Hack Slack channel. And if you go to brainhack.org, you can join it by just clicking in the top right hand corner. Um, there's a link right here that's join Slack channel. And so currently <laughs> we're losing messages. It's too big for, for Slack. We're working on uh, a, a solution for that. But if you go to the Slack channel, there's, uh, there's project boards on there. There's uh, future events are talked discussed on there. There's opportunities for you to communicate directly with other members of the community, which now is about 1,500 people at least that are members of the Brain Hack channel. Um, and also, you can look at, uh, you can look at um, job boards. We have job postings there. And also, if you have any job postings that you would like to put up, put it there. I've hired two postdocs from there. It's a pretty good source for it. Also, if you're interested in things that have happened before, um, we, we try to record as much as we can. And so we have brainhack.org and then lectures.html that has a lot of that information. Um, so the, and that's how you can stay contacted and sort of look at the stuff that's happened in the past. And another way that you can kind of learn about what's gone on for brain hacks, but also one way that you can participate is through our brain hack proceedings. So this started in 2015 when we uh, paired up with Giga Science to have uh, project descriptions from uh, things that happened at brain hack events published in, in a single volume. And um, and so most of these, these were 1,000 word or less short descriptions of the projects that you worked on. Um, and so if you think about it, the goal here is to emphasize projects which are very meaningful in terms of maybe making a contribution of a new tool or of new ideas uh, to the open science community, but maybe not big enough to merit a full publication and say neuroimage or something of that nature. So we thought this was a great idea to catalog the things that people do while they're at this event and at other hackathon events. Also, if your boss, you know, was wondering what you did while you were away in Seattle for two weeks, it gives you an opportunity to handle that. So in 2016, we did it through uh, RIO, which is a research 
outcome and ideas and outcomes. Um, and we had another issue there. If you go to the, the web page, you can look through these. So for 2018, we're doing a proceedings as well. And the project that y'all work on, the stuff that y'all work on while you're here is more than welcome to be submitted. The, um, we're going to be doing more of kind of a role our own um, rather than relying on uh, another publication company. The reasons why is, is publishing costs money. We had a pretty good d uh, gig with Giga Science, but then <laughs> even though everything they say is like, ah, oh, uh, impact factors are bad and we don't believe in impact factors, they told us that they didn't think our papers would have enough impact to include. So, <laughs> so we're not dealing with them anymore. We worked out a deal with F1000 Research. Uh, Michael Hanka worked out a deal with them. So if you um, are interested in publishing and then eventually want to have it published in F1000 Research, you can go through our pipeline and then submit it to them um, and, and get a, uh, a discount on your APC. But the basic idea that we're doing this year is, is we formed a bioarchive channel. And then if you submit your preprint to BioArchive, then and, and you know indicate that it's for the channel, then we'll include it into the channel. And then we'll get that'll involve an initial quote unquote technical review by the editorial board which is essentially making sure that it has all the information it needs to have in order to be a part of it, right? So a link to wherever the data is, it's properly formatted, it's obviously not a joke, right? Um, and then we're going to do a post-publication review uh, amongst, uh, through the Brain Hack community. So the editors will contact other members of the Brain Hack community and ask them to review your project report. And our goal, um, what we're going to do, are planning to do right now, is to post those pre-publication reviews on Academic Karma. So Academic Karma is a way that you can post open reviews and get credit for those. If you want an example of that, just search for Chris's name on there. I think you've done over 10, maybe 20 now. 30? 10? All right. So, so those will give you good examples of what that might look like. But Academic Karma is, is directly linked with BioArchive, so it helps you kind of pull those two together. And then, and then this process, this first process could iterate, of course, until things are done and good. And then once it's done, it'll be a part of the Brain Hack proceedings. It'll be listed on the web page, the Brain Hack web page. It'll be a part of the BioArchive channel. And then if you wish to go and send it off to get it published, published at another paper, then, of course, you retain those rights. Um, so that's kind of what we're working on, and we definitely encourage you to do this. Uh, we've had some, some great results. Uh, some of your colleagues here, uh, Lily has a paper there, Chris has some papers there. Uh, so, so many of our, your colleagues here have done this and can kind of attest to, to the utility of it, right? So when we reflect on our schedule, as I mentioned before, this is uh, now your uh, opportunity to apply your newly learned skills to, to problems you care about. Uh, so tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., project pitches. So, so if you don't have an idea, maybe tonight, just kind of think of one or two. So when it comes to projects, a project doesn't fail, right? So if, if you decide that you're working on a project and you decide that another project is more interesting to you or more people are interested in a different project, uh, you know, that's completely okay if, if, if your project is not completed, right? Many projects get uh, pitched and don't end up being completed. The, um, but I encourage you to, to work together with other people on, you know, uh, some of these projects and, and Anyway, like I said, if, if your project doesn't get picked up, it's not a, not a failure at all in the least. Um, throughout the day, there's going to be a couple of different uh, unconference, or throughout the last four days, a couple of different unconference sessions. I, I uh, am guessing that those will be dynamically um, scheduled around the times of the event. So if there's something you want to discuss, that'll be a time to do it. If there's something that you want to learn about, then encourage your, uh, your colleagues. Ask around, find somebody who knows something about it who would be willing to do kind of a short pop-up course on it. I believe there's going to be some other things going on in a local, in a nearby area. Is that right? So the idea is really you should feel free to talk about whatever you want, whatever you want, there's things that, you know, you really, and this has already happened, I think, quite a bit, right? So I mean, I'm, I'm, a lot of you said things like, well, I really know, I want to know a little bit more about an interactive visualization. Yeah. Yeah, keep it casual. Um, and you feel free to, you know, you, you're also a good pop. You can go around and say, hey, I'm thinking about talking about this, and we're going to hear about it. And that's great. So, um, within the constraint that we have, 
kind of a big 103, and this entire gigantic space up here. And so we want to obviously maintain we don't want to sort of interfere with what else is going on. So as long as it's a relatively quiet corner we work for the room, then you absolutely feel free. Uh, for the next conference talk, I think we have quite more data. We're going to have sign up lists, or if that's the most likely we will do this way to bring back that's it. And you'll okay. be able to propose. Here's the thing I want to talk about for five minutes. For five minutes. So, um, secrets to a successful brain hack. So, at the end of brain hacks, I've always I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who uh, have attended and whether they've had a good time or a bad time. And I've noticed a couple of things that seem to be, you know, kind of strong indicators about whether or not somebody thinks they have a bad time or not. So some things that uh, I would encourage you to think about. One thing is, is to think about what you mean by actual success, right? Um, so there's a lot of great things that you can get out of this. Even if you don't get a paper in the Brain Hack Proceedings, if your project isn't selected, if you, you know, if, if, if these other things happen, there's still a lot of valuable things that you get out out of this event. I think that the, one of the most valuable is going to be the relationships that you develop with the colleagues uh, that you've met here. But of course, you're going to learn, a, or I'm sure you've already learned, uh, new tools. Um, and, and even if you don't, haven't had an opportunity to learn the tools as deeply as you would like through the Hackathon event or through this event, then hopefully you've learned enough to get started down that path, right? Hopefully you're, you're at least given the, the, you've at least developed the confidence to be able to pursue uh, what you're interested in. And hopefully, you know, you've had an opportunity to make headway on a project to, to do something that kind of crystallizes the information that you've learned. Um, I would encourage you not to be afraid to fail, right? There, there's a lot of, I mean, what, I don't even know what failure would be like in this situation, but, you know, I guess deleting all of your data and killing your computer, uh, maybe. But, <laughs> but, you know, I've killed plenty of computers at brain hacks. It's usually the tequila shots that get me. But um, <laughs> another thing that I've noticed is, is people tend, if they rely too much on other people to kind of tell them what to do or to kind of be like, what's the next step? What is the next thing? That, uh, that it kind of, it, it tends to hold people back. So if you notice yourself go a little bit anxious about, you know, what are the next steps, what you should be doing now, then kind of maybe take a deep breath and just do whatever you want to do, right? I mean, there's a, there's a lot that can be done. Um, uh, find others with the skills that you want and chat them up. Uh, a lot of times, you know, a lot of the, the best interactions I've had have been working with people who maybe have developed a tool or have worked a lot with a tool that could give me a lot of insight into how to use that tool that would have taken me a really long time to develop otherwise. Um, if you have bandwidth, I'd like to encourage you to learn about many different projects and potentially contribute to many different projects. Try to kind of move around a little bit to get a sense of everything that's going on. I think that's a way to get a big, the best breadth of knowledge from this event. Um, and also, it's kind of uh, what Tal alluded to a little bit, so don't let FOMO get in the way of progress. And what I mean about that is, is that there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. As he mentioned, there's going to be a lot of different talks and different rooms and those things. It's okay to miss those things, right? It's okay to sit in a corner and, uh, you know, sort of ADHD in on a problem and focus exclusively on that for a while. Um, so the, the, this time is meant to be free and yours and sort of to, to allow you to kind of get the most out of the experience that you can, all right? So that was a description of brain hack. Does anybody here now not know what a brain hack event is? <laughs> is there anything that y'all are unclear about that would like more explanation? Are y'all maybe now consider going when you haven't considered going before? Is it less worrisome or scary now? Okay. So I could only come up with 30 minutes to say about the hackathon. Before you do that, um, I think what we're going to do is I'm going to post a link to uh, a spreadsheet for project. Um, it's self-explanatory. Just put down the name, uh, your description, and, and your handle. Uh, and and, and I've mentioned this too. There's no expectation that everyone in this room proposes a project. In fact, if everyone in this room did propose a project, we would probably have too many projects. Um, so you don't have to feel any pressure, like if things, you've been hearing things that sound really interesting, but you know, you're not like burning, you don't have a burning need to propose something, that's totally cool. Um, but if you do, and if you have three projects, that's also fine. Just, uh, so, and um, you can just put down uh, a project if you feel like it, and if not, then you can go there and, and get a sense of what people um, uh, are proposing to work on. And before the, 
our pitches tomorrow. Ariel and I will go through those, and if there's some that look very, very similar, we'll try to consolidate and maybe send you guys a thank you and say, hey, do you mind if we kind of put this together? Um, uh, and then, depending on how many of there are, we'll probably give everyone like anywhere from like one to three minutes to talk to the pitches. Um, yes? Well, can I um, also say, because I have this anxiety um, of growing heads and headphones, that if you pitch a project, you also don't have to lead that project. So you can stand up and you can give like a really cool pitch for your super cool idea. And if the next person that stands up says something that you're like, oh, that sounds really cool too, I think it's fine to like not do your idea, even if you pitch one. So it obviously leads to like a little bit of chaos if that, if, if like everyone just does the N plus one um, project. But I don't think that will happen in reality. And it's, it's fun to like not go through with the idea that you, you had after you hear everything else. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that if you, if you took all the project pitch results and the project pitch would happen times, if, it, if like half of those even were realized, I would have a much longer CV than actually do. So it's totally fine. <laughs> if, you know, if there's no expectation that most of those things will, will amount to some finished product. It's really just sort of, you throw it out there and see what sticks, and that's really the great thing. Y'all cool with that? So it's up to you if y'all want, but I was going to go and do a World War tour of free data on the internet and where to get it. Does that sound good? Okay, so I gave this recently at OHBM. Uh, Chris organized a great um, workshop on that. So I apologize if you've seen it before, but again, this is all about open science. The NERB Bureau is an organization, which I don't know if it's an organization anymore, which used to be about open science, but the, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about if y'all are going to do projects, one of the things that you might need is data, right? So I was going to give you some ideas of where you can find some data online. And here's just a combination of those things. The important thing is that there's a lot of different places where there's data available. Uh, one That contributes a bit to the problem of using this data because now if it's spread out, it's a bit hard to find, right? But it's sort of necessary that there's a lot of different people sharing data. We need to share this burden of data sharing amongst a lot of different people if it's going to succeed long term. So it's almost necessary that we have a lot of these. There's uh, by far most of the things that I know about are all MRI sort of focused uh, structure and function. There's uh, many different modalities that are also shared that maybe I know a little bit less about and are not as well uh, emphasized. One example is EEG. IEG.org does have a lot of EEG data. Because of the nature of EEG data, it tends to be more epilepsy oriented. Um, but uh, there's also some pet data that's been shared and, and some other types. And I'll, I'll go through a few of those different things, right? So the beginning of data sharing, at least when it comes to fMRI, was probably the fMRI DC. Uh, have you all heard of that? Is anybody here familiar with that? So this was, a, it was like fMRI data center. It was started at Dartmouth, and it was a way for people to share task experimental fMRI data online. And it ended up not go going so well. And one of the reasons was that not, not a lot of people were interested in uh, putting their data there. Uh, one of the gentlemen that was a leadership of that project uh, was uh, also an editor at a journal, and he had created a mandate of the journal that the data had to be shared through fMRI DC in order to succeed. There was wide spread public backlash to that idea and that concept. And a lot of people are like, why should we share data? It's our data, yada, yada, right? And so that was the beginning of data sharing. There were also a lot of, there was also projects like there was the Oasis project that was uh, through WashU, it was a, a, an x Night installation where you could download some free data. Mike Fox was heavily involved in the beginning of that one. But the, those first couple of them didn't really seem to get traction. And the reason I think they didn't get traction is because the community had yet to sort of come around to the idea of both using shared data and the idea that your data, you should share your data in a lot of ways uh, that they have. And then kind of spontaneously around 2010, the, um, the community changed its mind a little bit when it came to the 1000 Functional Connectomes Project. So this was an effort that was spearheaded by Barat Biswal and Michael Milham to try to put together a thousand resting state fMRI data sets so that they could look at things like sex and age differences in 
resting state fMRI. Once they collected all that data, they got about 1,300, they decided to share it. And surprisingly, they were able to get everybody on board who was a member of that. Well, most everybody. There's some of these data sets that actually aren't available, although they're done. So I call this sort of the re-beginning of data sharing because this one, it was kind of, you know, a, an old idea that had been recycled somewhat, but at this point it kind of stuck. And I, and I don't really understand why, other than the fact that maybe the community was a lot more willing to do it. Also, there's not a lot of perceived value in resting state fMRI data as compared to task-based data. If you're a, you know, a, a cognitive neuroscientist, you may sort of perseverate for the majority of your career over an fMRI task design and be more reluctant to share it. Yeah, Gail? Uh, if I can point out something I think quite uh, also rest is easier to share. It's just it's easier to describe. Sure. As somebody who tries to do media analysis on, on the data that people share, it's right. such a challenge, a fundamental challenge, not a trivial right. challenge, to do to yeah. It's just right. And, and, and this is actually is a very good segue to my next point. One of the major drawbacks of this data set is we didn't know any of the scanning parameters on any of these individuals. Right? So if you wanted to do a meta-analysis, you can on this data. If you wanted to do a really good meta-analysis, you can't on this data. The only thing that was known about these individuals were sex and handedness and age, right? So there's not a lot of covariation there to do the things that we're really interested in. So whereas this data set has been used for some very important methodological papers, such as the um, cluster failure paper, it also has limitations to be used more broadly in, say, psychology or inter-individual differences. And and seeing that, uh, the creators of FCP decided to create INDI, which is the International Neuroimaging Data Sharing Initiative. And the goal here is to have deeply phenotype data, or, or at least somewhat phenotype data, right? So all the data that's donated here has to have the imaging parameters um, from the get-go, but also there has to be something else other than age, sex, and handedness, right? So either a di diagnosis or an IQ test or something else to go with the data. So currently, there's about 35 different projects under Indy. It's over 10,000 participants. The majority of the data, uh, there's uh, 98 non-human primate participants. The majority of the data is structural MP rage and resting state fMRI. Um, that is still the, the, the number one thing that they shared, but there's also a lot more data now. There's T2, quantitative MRI, DTI, and some others. There's, there's a, na a notion of prospective and retrospective data sharing as well. So some of the data is actually being shared as it's being collected before it's even published. Those are prospective. And the retrospective are data that's kind of, you know, well published, been around for a while. I don't even know why we make that distinction because it really doesn't matter in the long term. And eventually all the prospective data is going to be come retrospective anyway, but it, it was a distinction, I think, maybe more for, for, for talking. So uh, the ND uh, uses a consortium model, and the goal is, is to get a lot of PIs together to, to combine their data in order to create a bigger data that maybe we can use some of these cool techniques that Sam A was talking about on the data, right? And so ADHD 200 is an early example of this. They were able to put together uh, data sets on almost um, about a thousand individuals, half with ADHD, half uh, typical. And they, when they started this, they started it with a competition to see who could get the best uh, classifier accuracy between ADHD and not ADHD in this data set. Um, and there was some really interesting results out of that. That was followed eventually by Abide. Uh, we, we learned from the first one. So in this case, I don't know if y'all have heard about this. It was a bit in the press, but the, the data ended up being much more, much better differentiated. You can use a better classifier by using things just like head motion and sight ID alone than you could the neuroimaging data. And it really sort of emphasized the reality of working in hyperkinetic populations where things like head motion are kind of driving your entire signal. Um, but also when you tend to have competitions uh, on these style of things, I mean I personally disagree with the idea in general, but usually you end up with people trying to game the competition and the successful people in many 
cases, maybe the people that have more effectively gamed the competition than anything else. And an example of this, what used to be the PRNI, which was a prediction challenge in neuroimaging. And one year, Carlton Chu won it, and he, he wrote the paper about it in neuroimage. And it's really interesting, if you read it, you see that pretty much everything that he did was just in order to improve his score, right? I mean, it was total, everything was sort of as cross-validated, just learn the score, or learn to improve the score of whatever the, the challenge uh, thing is. And at the end of the day, that, that knowledge isn't necessarily very generalizable because you've overfit. So with Abide, we never did that type of competition. But so with Abide, it's a little bit more. Now it's up to 2,000 individuals, half, that should be, sorry, autism, ASD, and not ADHD, and 1,100 uh, typicals. So these are some examples of some very good data sets that have uh, you know, very rich phenotypic information in it that, that are very valuable. Uh, Gael has done some outstanding work with Abide as well as some others. So in the case of actually trying to figure out how to compare our methods, there's a, since we have no gold standard, we have to rely on other types of ways of evaluating. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about these over the weekend or over the past week. And the majority of them for what we're concerned about is reproducibility, right? And in order to evaluate the reproducibility of our methods, you need to have test retest data um, or <laughs> a whole lot of data. And so that drove the creation of CORE, which is a consortium for reproducibility and reliability. So these data sets don't have a lot of phenotypic information, but every data set has a test retest. And there's a lot of different designs in here. There's um, examples, there's two participants that were scanned five times a day for three days. There was one participant that was scanned over a hundred times. There's, um, as you can see, there's uh, 1,629 different individuals and they, they accumulate to over 5,000 resting state scans. So there's some really cool test retest styles uh, of studies in there. Um, so recently we came up with primate uh, data exchange, which is non-human primate data. Um, the, uh, we have 25 international sites, 98 animals. And so here these animals, they have both anesthetized and awake. Uh, and some of them are watching movies, which is pretty cool. This is monkeys watching movies of monkeys. <laughs> so even the, yeah. So uh, beyond resting state, so open fMRI, which is now open neuro, um, is really, you know, it, it came on strong. It was very, had a very uh, task-centric um, focus in the beginning, but now it shares anything that uh, you'd like to put up there. Now, it, it, when we did this, and it's probably been updated, or needs updating, but at that time, there was 122 distinct data sets, over 4,000 unique participants, and 208 different tasks. So a variety of really interesting data. There's also, of course, data in there of individuals of different uh, uh, diagnoses, so um, there's the uh, phenomics, uh, so there's um, some really interesting data sets in there, <laughs> sorry. There's, so the My Connectome project, this is where Russ scanned himself 107 times, three times a week, and so he, he also did um, genetics on himself, blood pressure, weight, a bunch of different things, so a very interesting data set, a lot of data. Um, a lot of different tasks that he did as well. Uh, so also uh, data set driven, um, or at least that the Russ is a part of, is the, uh, this uh, phenomics data set, so 130 controls, 50 schizophrenia and 49 bipolar and 43 ADHD, and it's a very deep phenotyping battery. So a lot of different multidimensional data, um, labels that you can use for cool learning algorithms, or you know if you're interested in a specific cognitive domain, maybe there's there's uh, proof of, or maybe there's data that you can use to help build your hypotheses from there. Um, so uh, open fMRI also illustrates the beauty of having data that has been kind of a part of a, of a major debate openly available. So when, so this is from Haxby's data set, we're looking at, uh, you know, faces versus other things and uh, the ability to, so this is uh, attributed to being one of the very first MVPA papers, but it also led to a lot of debate about whether or not there's actually a few a form face area that specialized to the face, and there was a big debate about that. And now that data set's being shared on open fMRI, so if you want to kind of test the hypotheses or validate the, the whether or not there's an FFA in the data, you can do it yourself, as well as maybe come up with some innovative ways to prove it wrong. Uh, so that's another cool thing about having this data out there. Um, there's also a lot of, so everything I described before, uh, to some extent, maybe the open fMRI wasn't a good example, are, are kind of these post hoc aggregated data sets, right? So everybody kind of looks around, pulls out the data that they have and puts it together. And the problems we have with that is there's a whole lot of technical variation in that data that can 
affect our results adversely, right? And so there's been some good results. Gael had a good result showing that maybe we can overcome this technical variation with large enough numbers. I don't know if you still believe that or not. I, I think it's reasonable. Yeah, okay, he still believes it. Um, but some of these other data sets have more value in that they're centralized. Everything is collected from day one to match exactly the same parameters, the same equipment, everything, so that you get rid of that uh, variation. Um, and here's a lot of different projects. You probably know, uh, sort of some of these. The uh, Brain Genomic Superstruct Project is a great example of this. Ping um, ABCD is a new project. 10,000 individuals starting at age 10 being followed for 10 years of their life. It's a huge study. Um, hopefully be su successful. One of the projects I was involved with is the NKA Rockland sample. So we have right now it's over a thousand participants that are spread out across four different studies. In the beginning it started off as a, as a cross-sectional study in people 8 to 80 or 8 to 85 and we've had follow-ons with a child longitudinal that images children, 180 children, 8 18 years old, they're scanned three times. We have neurofeedback task, which is one of my studies, which are adults um, doing uh, real-time neurofeedback of the default mode network, um, and then an adult longitudinal, which are 40 to 85 year olds, which um, it also includes cardiovascular fitness. So it's a very, uh, it's a base connectomes protocol. We have a lot of structure and DTI in there and resting state fMRI. So there are some tasks in there, but it's for example, breath holding, which is something you could maybe use to calibrate your data. We also have a flashing checkerboard that you can use to kind of evaluate the quality of the data to some degree, but it's, um, you know, pretty sort of connectome specific. But over here is the phenotyping protocol. And this is what really sort of separates this data set from many of the other ones, is, is that it's a very deep phenotype that uncovers behavioral measure, you know, mental, emotional health, um, it covers physical health measures. It covers just a ton of different stuff. Um, we have hematocrit in there. We have uh, base VO2, some measure of cardiovascular fitness in there. Just a ton of different things. So these are some fairly well characterized individuals. You can argue whether the sample size are really big enough to fully take advantage of this very multivariate sort of profile. But you know, if you're interested in smoking, we got the Fagerstrom, right? If you're interested in alcohol, we know all of their alcohol usage habits. If you're interested in working memory and smoking, you know, you can kind of get a lot of data out of here. So in these protocols, it's also different is, is that in terms of exclusionary criteria, we have very few. The only people we excluded are people that we were worried about may present a harm to us or to others that were there. So we have a lot of different psychiatric diagnoses in there. And rather than excluding those people, our approach is just to write it down. So to make sure that we have very clean diagnoses on everybody, we keep very meticulous records on who those individuals are. Um, so about 50% of the data set is our typical controls, people that would be typically labeled a healthy control. The other 50% suffer from some diagnoses. The most frequent are alcohol related. Next to that are things like depression. It kind of follows what you would expect from um, you know, basic morbidity information. Um, we followed this on uh, with the Healthy Brain Network. And y'all, I know y'all known a little bit more uh, about this. So if you really want to look at these classifiers, and we've talked a lot about biomarkers of disease, but if you think about it, there's a major problem in how we do these, right? And I got a couple of papers that do this too, so, you know, I'm not being, trying to be overly critical of anybody else, but you take a healthy population and an ADHD population, you calculate your prediction accuracy for differentiating them, and then you say, well, I can diagnose ADHD, say, 98% of the time, right? Or when it came to my PhD dissertation, depression, 95% of the time, right? So before we actually use that clinically, or even think about that as anything clinically useful, it might be nice to know, well, what happens if you have somebody with anxiety? Does your classifier classify them as depressed or healthy, right? We have no measure of the specificity of these methods because we don't have the data to do it, right? Other than the phenomics data set, which is a fantastic data set that I, I just talked about, where they had schizophrenia, ADHD, and another population. In general, we just look at one disease and one healthy population. So the goal with the Healthy Brain Network is to try to create a sample that is very rich in terms of many different diagnoses so we can begin to look at this, right? So uh, this is uh, going to be 10,000 individuals, a cross-sectional study, and when we do the recruitment, we do it from the perspective of, you know, 
telling parents, are you worried about your child? If you are, come talk to us, right? So the data is enriched for people who are either above threshold for a psychiatric classification or just sub threshold for a classification. So when you work at this data set, I wouldn't assume that any of the people are pure healthy controls. I would think that, you know, they got something going on. On this one, we have a, um, We've done a couple of different data collections as a part of this. We've started moving to movies to replace some of the resting state. So we have a lot of movie data in there and gotten a little bit more dimensional in terms of the structure, uh, including T1 weighted and T2 weighted uh, imaging as well. And again, huge phenotypic battery. We try to write down as much information as we can. Yes. Peer is eye tracking. So you can actually, I, you can actually, from the MRI signal, you can determine where somebody's looking on a screen. And so there's peer training scans, which are the actual peer scans. And with those, people are watching a calibration scan and looking, fixating on dots. You can train a classifier from the fMRI data, just the eye signal, to the position on the screen that they're looking at. Then you can apply that to new data, like movie watching data, and see where they were looking on those screens. It's a really cool technique. Um, we recently have a paper that came out about that, if you want more information. Um, it's probably in BioArchive, so if you'll search Craddock and Milham, and then just look through the few that come up, you'll be able to find it. But it's awesome technique. We also have a huge EEG battery uh, on these individuals as well. And this was specifically designed to be a multidimensional kind of mental health sort of battery that we have. So a lot of... Uh, a, a lot of interesting study, um, different EEG studies that are a part of it. A uh, resting state in there as well. Um, of course, I'm going to get a little bit faster. Of course, y'all know about the Human Connectome Project. They have many different projects that are associated with them now. There's a lifespan connectome. There's a, a mental health oriented one. So definitely check them out. The connectome coordinating facility is also developing some really cool tools for using data and doing things with data. Um, also, there's process data out there. Um, I encourage you to, to you know, if you, if you don't want to spend the time to have to re-preprocess a thousand individuals, there's data sets like the ADHD 200 preprocessed. Uh, my colleagues and I in the NeuroBureau created this when the ADHD 200 competition came out to prospectively collaborate with all would-be enters. Uh, so that they could just use the pre-processed data. Um, so that's been used well. The Abide, we have a pre-processed version of that. One of the things that differentiates our Abide processing from ADHD is that we have a lot of different pipelines out there. So you can begin to see how some of your pipeline decisions uh, will affect your results if you want to do that evaluation as well. Also, we have some uh, cortical measures in there that are a bit better. Um, of course, uh, OpenEuro is a great repository of pre-processed data or to pre-process your data if you're willing to share it. The, um, so there's also some manually labeled data with, uh, with some of the cool machine learning techniques. You may want to be able to learn a new way to sort of to maybe segment uh, stroke lesions or maybe to, to, brain, to skull strip uh, MP rage data. So there's some data out there where people have done hand tracings and uh, made the data available. That's another resource that may be of value. Of course, Neurosynth is a lot of the data that, that is, is sort of the, the, the history or maybe the memory of our field or locked up into papers and hard to extract. Neurosynth does a valiant effort to try and extract that information and make it readily available to you to be able to do some meta-analysis and develop hypotheses, network models about brain function. Um, of course, everything that we generate in terms of uh, these as these you know, parameter maps that we write our papers on, they end up getting lost as soon as we convert it in a table and publish it, right? So it's very useful if we could actually publish those original statistical maps. So at the, I don't know if this started, this wasn't at the first brain hack. You did the button in France, but did you work on this in Leipzig at all? Right. Right. And then the brave little button was added in France. <laughs> so anyway, so NeuroVault has had a history that's closely tied to uh, this. I mentioned before the problem with having all of this data available is, is that it's hard to find. One of the best places to find it is on Nitric. Um, a lot of different projects that are available there. Generally, if I have a, a, a problem that I don't know if a tool exists or not, I'll just try to formulate some search here to find it. Um, I, you know, it, it's not necessarily the best infrastructure for searching in these things, but they do a really good job and they try hard. They also have some great tools for data.
data sharing, as well as for uh, their cloud environment for execution. And I went over by three and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, the only slides I have left are about showing the, the, you know, kind of the impact of data sharing, which I don't think y'all need to know about. Um, so hopefully I've given you a brief understanding, hopefully give you a, an idea of what you're supposed to do for the next four days in terms of your hackathon experience. Um, and also, you know, here's some great resources you can use that may aid in that path. Is there anything else I can help anyone with? Uh, yes. These slides actually already may be already be shared. How about this? I'll just um, I'll just drag them to the channel, and then that'll be the easiest way to do it. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs>